Whoa! 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 Come on, Jen! Oh, my border beeper is going crazy. That means we're close to the U.S. And that can mean only one thing. We are in the southernmost point in Canada. Oh, I need a rest. Well, no wonder you've got all that stuff. No, we are going to use all this stuff. The place we are going, there's going to be tons of birds and butterflies and bees. And since yeah. we're going to be so close to Lake Erie, I thought we'd get a little fish in it. Lovely. Okay. Jennifer, you know what? i got to hand it to you. You have thought of everything. Hi there. It'll be six fifty if you wanted to come into Point Pelee National Park. OK, I thought of everything except my wallet. Hi. He'll pay. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. See what? you in there. You take pennies. In this episode of CG Kids, we head to Canada's most southern point, located out in Lake Erie, Ontario. We go butterfly counting and get the buzz on bee farming from 16-year-old Ryan Moffat. Then we check out some of Lake Erie's alien species, ooh, and have a muscle-eating contest. In Jay's Geology, I check out how plants can actually clean water. A zombie lake, happy insects, and bad muscles, all on this episode of CG Kids. You know, I could rig up my border beeper so I could find your wallet. Okay, could you just stop that already, Jamie? I told you I would give you your money as soon as I found my... wallet. Pay up. We are here in the southernmost part of Canada. Now, this region is referred to as Southwestern Ontario, and it is an area of extremes. It has some of Canada's largest cities, richest farmland, biggest lakes, and smallest national park. Yet Canada's most southern point is just a little itty piece of land that juts into Lake Erie, and it's protected by Point Pelee National Park of Canada. This park is known throughout North America as a popular migratory stopover for hundreds of species of birds and thousands of monarch butterflies. So it's very hard to believe that we are within one of Canada's most populated regions. There are tons of towns around. With probably bag machines. Oh, would you stop? I'll give you your money. You better. Hey, you guys, be nice. Jennifer and Jamie are definitely in Canada's sunny self. But as they said, it's also really jam-packed with our country's population. In fact, Southern Ontario is home to nearly one out of four Canadians. <laughs> Southern Ontario starts from Canada's largest city, Toronto, and continues to the southern area of Lake Erie. It contains some of the biggest cities in Canada. The cities of Windsor and Chatham are just a short drive from Point Pelee. There are almost 7 million people living in Southern Ontario, but they actually live on less than 1% of Canada's land. There are few reasons why this narrow strip of land is so heavily populated. One is that Southern Ontario is pretty much surrounded by three of the Great Lakes, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. The lakes help to modify the climate of this area. The mild temperatures and rich soil have given Southern Ontario some of the best agricultural land in the country. Towns and cities also developed around the lakes to take advantage of the natural shipping route they provided. So Southern Ontario has always attracted a lot of companies and offered a lot of jobs. What Jennifer and Jamie are exploring is a little strip of land that juts out from Southern Ontario's most southern point. If I click on the population marker with the larger circles representing the major cities, you can see how jam-packed this area is. Actually, let's take a look at the full image of Ontario to give you a good comparison. Wow! So with a large population, intense farming and heavy manufacturing, Southern Ontario is the most urbanized area in Canada. No wonder the only national park here is so small. Monarchs are just one species of butterfly that you can find in Point Pelee. 
In fact, it's one of the best places in Canada to find butterflies, period. The reason for this is that flying across the Great Lakes isn't easy when you're a little winged creature migrating south. But Point Pelee Peninsula offers them both a chance to rest and the shortest route across the lakes. And we are just in time for the Point Pelee annual butterfly count. So we're going to see how many species we can find. Now we're supposed to be counting along with 16-year-old Ryan Moffat, but we can't find him. Well, it's a small park. I mean, we got to be able to find him. I think we just found him. Ryan? Hello! Hello! Come on over! Hey, Ryan! Hey. How's it going? You want to go count some butterflies? Sure. All right. <laughs> Ryan likes to take part in these counts because they help keep track of the butterfly populations. Last year, they counted 43 different species. Ryan lives on a farm not far away. When you have a farm, don't you have like tons of chores to do? Well, we have to take care of the bees. Take care of the bees? Yeah, would you like to go see them? You better believe it. Oh, that is so bad. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> But before we could even get close to the bees, Ryan's dad had us put on protective clothing. So, Peter, why are you smoking the bees? The smoking will calm the bees down. They get into a natural fright, and they gorge themselves with honey, as they would in the wild if there was a forest fire, in case they have to take flight. Just like yourself, after a big meal, you're much more contented. The bees are the same way. They're gorged, and they're satisfied, and they uh, won't sting you, they won't sting you or me nearly as much. You can hear it all humming, this whole box. Since the bees are calm now, Ryan showed us the compartments or cells that the bees have built and where they store the honey. Each of the cells contain combs that the bees make using wax that they secrete from glands under their bellies. Ryan and his family have been bee farming and selling honey for seven years. Now there are three different types of bees. What do they do? Well, you have your workers, which are the female. Their uh, primary duty is to go out and uh, to get the nectar and bring it back to the hive. And then you have your queen, which is the reproducer and to get more bees. And then you have your drones, which are the males, which basically sit around the hive all the time. So all the workers are females, and all the boys are just drones that sit around the hive all day. Sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, hmm? yeah, yeah. So this is a bare beeswax frame that in about two weeks will be full of honey? Yes, uh, this is a foundation in the beehive. The, the bees will build this up with wax. How do they make the honey? They take uh, the nectar from flowers, and then they bring it back to the hive, and they put it into the cells. And then how do you take that honey and put it in the jar? Well, you see, we take the, all these frames and you put a couple of them in this, which is an extractor. You here, you put them in there, and they'll. You, th then this extractor moves really fast. It just starts circling really, really fast, and the honey will whip out to the sides and then drain down to the bottom. And, and then you take it out from the bottom. We then have what you see in the stores. <laughs> honey. We heard that because bees don't have words, they communicate through dance. Yes, that's true. They, that's how they communicate where things are. Would you like me to show you? Sure. <laughs> yes! Well, it's kind of like a waggle thing going on. Okay. So you gotta get in the figure eight motion here. Okay. <laughs> but I'm doing it alone. Why don't you guys give it a try? Okay. And then what are we trying to tell each other? Uh, normally it's where uh, nectar is or where they want to move to. There's flowers on the hill. There's flowers on the hill. Flowers on the hill over there. No, that, that's just wrong. <laughs> This is good honey. I still think you're crazy for doing it, though. Those bees, I don't know. What is that? That's not a real bee. No. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> Eldon, what are you doing? Oh, what do you think I'm doing? Oh, is this that bee kid? Yes. What about yeah. this bee kid? Yeah, you're one of those guys who uses those high-tech bee stuff, huh? What do you mean? You know what? If you want to get honey, you got to hunt the bees like we used to. You would hunt bees? You want to know how? Okay, I'll show you. Okay, Jenny, you take the flower. Okay. And you, bee kid, can you pick up that bee there, please? This bee? Yes. And then you go up to the flower and they... 
Oh, look at all the pollen. Oh, won't the queen be proud of me? Nom, 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 nom. And then the bee is attracted to the flower. Okay. Now, come on, guy. Be a bee. You know what they're like. They buzz and stuff. Come on. You want me to buzz? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Buzz. Oh, uh, yeah, that's good. Okay, you're happy there, right, B? You're just relaxed there like that. And then it's time to milk it. Milk a bee? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just milk it like a cow. All right, guys, it's Triviography time, 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 time. And this is a very special one because it's the first time we've ever done the triviography question from a tree. <sighs> History in the making. <laughs> and the historic question is, what is a biome? Biome? And it's not one of those stadiums with a retractable roof. Get your own. And it's not those little guys you stick out on your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we didn't offend them. I don't think so. But they might be offended if you don't stand around like a gnome waiting for the answer. <laughs> this is Point Pelee Marsh, one of the biggest marshes in the Great Lakes region. And like most wetlands, it supports an incredible array of wildlife, fish, plants, birds, insects, reptiles, amphibians, all depend on the wetlands for their survival. Now, because the marsh is surrounded by cities and prime agricultural land, it's a very fragile environment. Fortunately, there are a lot of people working very hard to make sure the natural wonders of Point Pelee survive for many years to come. We're meeting up with Amy Teslin, who's a park interpreter here at Point Peely. How's it going, Amy? Hello. Hello, Amy. Hello. Woo. This park is amazing. What makes it so unique? It is very unique. It's the southernmost point of mainland Canada. So we have a lot of plants and animals that are very southern. Things like hibiscus and cactus and things like that. So we protect a very unique Carolinian life zone, it's called. And more species at risk here than anywhere else in Canada. With all these visitors walking through, how do you take care of the park? Well, uh, there is a visitor code. So people aren't allowed to litter because that's very harmful to the habitats. And you cannot feed the plants and animals. They can find their own food. And also you can't collect anything. And that includes things like feathers or rocks or even driftwood. But that's actually homes for a lot of animals too. So how come the wetlands are so important? You can see lots of plants around us right now. And plants give us what? Oxygen! Yeah, so actually Yay. wetlands give us the most oxygen in the world. And these cattails are like a sponge that helps to filter the water. So it purifies the water. And it also acts as a buffer zone, a sponge to help reduce erosion and also flooding too. How have some creatures adapted to living in a marsh? They definitely are used to a lot of sun and a lot of the insects underneath the water have really interesting adaptations. Can we actually. see some? Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Just grab all these aquatic plants. That's where the insects are hiding out. We're gonna drag it right up on shore and then we're gonna have a look through and see what we found. Got all kinds of things in here, look at that. That's the diving beetle that has the air bubble that it takes underwater like a scuba tank. Amazing. So who's this little guy? You have a dragonfly nymph. Dragonfly nymphs are baby dragonflies. That eat the mosquitoes That's so we right. don't have to get bugged. Exactly, and they have this little lower lip. It actually reaches out and grabs some of the insects. Like a shovel face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is a water scorpion. And you can see the tube that comes off of the abdomen. It's like a snorkel, actually. It doesn't sting. It uses it to breathe through. So you can see that this is just teeming with life. Amazing. And then after that, what you have to do is put all the marsh plants back in so that they survive. Oh, they're aquatic insects. There we go. 
thank you so much, Amy. You know what? I don't think I will ever think of pond scum the same way. Well, I'm glad. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Thanks. Very, thank you. Well, thank you. Good luck. <laughs> What do you think they want from us? I don't know. Well, do you think they're mad because we were laughing at them? I don't know. We weren't laughing at them. We're laughing with them. Okay, we have to do something. Okay, I'll call for help. Help. We're being surrounded by evil band of gnomes. Don't forget to tell Jay the triviography question. Oh, yeah. Jay, what is a biome? What is a biome? Good question. Basically, a biome refers to a community of plants and animals in a certain region and climate. Major biomes include ocean, desert, grassland, taiga, tundra, rainforest, and temperate forest. Southern Ontario is part of a temperate forest biome, but some of this area, including Point Pelee, is also part of something called the Carolinian Life Zone. Because the southern point of Ontario has the same latitude as Northern California, it has trees, plants and animals associated with the self and unique to the rest of Canada. Although it only makes up 1% of Canada's land, the Carolinian life zone has more species than any other ecosystem in the country. Just 35 years ago, Lake Erie was considered to be a dead lake. Hardly any species could survive in these waters. Now it's taken a lot of work, but Lake Erie is coming back to life. But there is still a lot of work involved to ensure the lake stays healthy. Pollution is a major threat to the health of our lakes, but the introduction of an alien species into a body of water can prove to be disastrous. This little guy is a zebra mussel. Before 1988, you would never have seen one of these guys in North American waters. We've come to Wheatley Harbor to meet Tim Johnson. He's an aquatic ecologist with the Ministry of Natural Resources. Tim! Hi, guys. Welcome to Lake Erie. Hello, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hello. So what sort of species came here and caused all this trouble? Well, there's been over 162 species that are now invading Lake Erie. And those range from things like zebra mussels, and round gobies as a fish, sea lamprey, like a big eel that sticks to fish, purple loosestrife as a plant. So there's been a whole variety of different things that have come in. How did they all get here? Typically they arrive in the ballast water of transoceanic freighters. Basically these ships have huge tanks that hold water and when they move across the ocean, they use those tanks to stabilize the ships. When they arrive here, they pump that water out and with the water comes all the organisms. Can we actually go and check out some of these goby fish and zebra mussels? Sure, let's go back to the lab and I'll show them to you. Lead the way! Tim took us to the Ministry of Natural Resources lab where his research team is studying why some of the alien species found in Lake Erie, like the goby fish and zebra mussel, are thriving so well. Tim estimates that there could be as many as 100,000 mussels per square meter and over 11 billion gobies in Lake Erie. The interesting thing is that the gobies eat the zebra mussels, but this also means they ingest any contaminants in the mussels and could spread them on to other fish. How would a new species affect the ecological balance? Typically it's because they interfere either with the, the feeding or the food supply of the native organisms or with their, their habitats, uh, preventing them from accessing important areas that they spawn or reproduce in. So what sort of experiments do you do? And here you can see we have some lots of round gobies, the fish, and then there's some zebra mussels. And the sorts of experiments that we'll try is to see how many zebra mussels and what size zebra mussels are eaten by the gobies. I like my goby. But Jen, they're an eco-disaster. Well, what I thought we could do here, if you guys want, is we're going to actually do an experiment with the gobies. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to see how big a zebra mussel the gobies can eat. My goby can take any kind of mussel. Big mussels, small mussels, this goby's taking it home. Come on, goby, do it for the team. Jen was right. Her little guy ate the smallest mussel and then nabbed the larger one. There he goes. Gobies can actually crush and swallow the whole shell and then later spit it back out. Thank you so much, Tim. This has been very, very informative. Yes, thanks, Tim. And thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Go. Nothing. Take good care of him. He's a good one. 
Most lakes are home to tons of different life forms, plants, animals, and fish. Some are big, and yet some are so small that you would need a microscope to see them. Who knows how many are swimming around my feet? But in the 1960s and 70s, Lake Erie became so polluted that it was pretty much considered to be a dead lake. Barely anything could live in it. By the mid-1980s, a huge lake cleanup began, which was fairly successful. But we still need to do what we can to give the lake a hand. When we get dirty, we can take a shower or bath to stay healthy and clean. In nature, plants and animals can actually do the same thing. Obviously, it's hard on a lake when things like excessive amounts of human waste, chemicals, and detergents are being dumped into it. But let's find out how nature tries to clean itself. Plants also help keep water clean in small quantities. Plants can actually benefit from things we think of as pollutants. That's why the plants in the wetlands around Lake Erie are so important in keeping it clean. Household wastewater that we shower and do laundry with is called gray water. It actually contains some nutrients that plants use for food. Water has something called a pH level. This pH level measures the degree of acidity in water. Seven is considered neutral. Water measuring below seven is termed acidic, and water above seven is termed basic. In general, plants like water to be between five and seven, but pollution can change all that. This is a common tester used to measure pH levels in swimming pools. I'm going to compare the pH level of my gray water with my fresh water. My gray water has a pH level of 8.4, and my fresh water has a level of 7.6. I'm going to put one of these plants, roots only, in the gray water, and the other in the fresh water. As the dirty water reaches the roots of this plant, the plant eats up some of the contaminants that it can use. I'm going to tie plastic bags over the tops of the plants, and as the water moves through the root system, it will come out through the plant's leaves, and should be cleaner. This is called transpiration. The water's impurities are then left trapped within the plant. Now I'm gonna test the pH level of the water that has transpired into this bag versus the pH level of the water surrounding its roots. The water in the bag should be cleaner. Let's see. It's 7.6 versus 8.2 of the remaining water. This plant has done a pretty good job of cleaning up. If lakes contain too many of these contaminants, plants can't keep up with it and too much algae will form. Algae uses up a lot of the water's oxygen oxygen that fish really rely on. I guess I'd better help clean up Sammy's lake. A fantastic fact about Southern Ontario is that it has the world's first and one of the longest underwater car tunnels ever built connecting two countries. The city of Windsor, Ontario is connected to the American city of Detroit by a 1.6 kilometer long tunnel. Giant cylinders were dug towards each other from either country and nine massive sections of steel were cemented together by divers. It opened in November 1930 and today, over 9 million vehicles pass through the Windsor-Detroit Tunnel every year. There! What's taking you so long? It's like you've packed way more than when we arrived here. Okay, well, I may have picked up a thing or two, or four. Sheesh. Goodbye, Southern Canada! Goodbye, birds and trees and beautiful Earth! <laughs> what? Oh, nice! Nice trick! You're leaving me with the weird garden gnomes! <laughs> Just one tiny muscle. Just give us one little muscle of poor little geography hosts. <laughs> they can't keep us here forever. We just have to smile, Jen. We need a big smile. Big, big, big. Smile. <laughs> We're growing. They'll just keep us because we have Yeah, to get to the dentist, girl. Hey.